I will say often that when it comes to WWE, it's all about the little things. So small, finer point details that can really make or break an angle or a match or a story. And I'll say this week, the WWE at least gave you a little bit more when it comes to Raw. A little bit more. They were still off the mark with a lot of those finer points and details. And it feels like really it's far too little far too late. And again, even watching the show, not just from my own feeling, but the feeling that was given to me was that other than maybe one thing here and one thing there, the WWE is pretty much resigned to their fate that this is going to be a forgettable WrestleMania. Oh my God, it's not enough that my Samoan stud muffin Roman Reigns is main eventing WrestleMania 31. Stick it up yours, jabronis. Oh my God, I found out now that my hunk, LL Cool J, is going to be performing at WrestleMania's. Oh, his bald head, those muscles, that money, all oh, those things that make a girl go wild. Love you, LLs. Love you, Romans. All we need is for my favorite quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, to make an appearance. And then maybe Lucius Lyon comes in, too. And they all fight over summer. Yeah, it'll be the greatest night ever. WrestleMania is going to be awesome. Love you, LLs. Love you, Romans. Call me. I'm sure some of you are happy that AJ and Nikki got a ton of time on the show, and that's all fine and good. At least they got the chance to actually have a regular, re like, real match that actually kind of mattered. But at the end of the day, Give Divas a Chance is not just about one five- or six-minute match. It's about more than that. It's about featuring your divas like they matter. It's about featuring them like they are of consequence and significance. And even when you have a match like this, like I've said before, as fans, we've been programmed for so long to not give a damn about the divas that you find yourself still not giving a damn about the divas, even if the WWE tries to tease you a little bit that they do. But they don't. And don't be moronic. Don't be fooled. Because they're still not really doing anything to actually try and tell any type of real story heading into this Divas tag match at WrestleMania. It's largely randomly thrown together match, match, match to match format and the same old bullshit. They're not giving anybody a fucking chance. I think the WWE is significantly underrating Ryback and severely missing the boat with Ryback. Even to the point where on this week's show, at least he got a freaking entrance. So that way people could actually get behind the guy, which they do consistently week in and week out, but he's still being used as a plot device for what's going on between The Miz and Miz Don. That's kind of a shame. Ryback should have a somewhat featured match at WrestleMania and not be a part of the schmas of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And then even when it comes to The Miz and Miz Don, this is something that also shouldn't be stuck in the schmas of that battle royal, but it's going to be. But at least I can say this, a lot of the things that they've done with this has been really damn good. The Miz can be the WWE's MVP in 2015, and once again on this week's show, you see why. You know, and the whole thing about who's going to win that battle royal, many will probably point to Mizdow should be the guy to win it. I disagree strongly. It needs to be the Miz. It has to be the Miz because you can still launch off of that and give Miz and Mizdow their own feature match, let's say, at Extreme Rules. You know, if you have Mizdow win at WrestleMania, you know, are they really going to follow up with that? No, I think they get more benefit out of it as a company throughout 2015 and long term by having Miz win that match, having Miz get that spotlight, having Miz get that shine, and then you really got a monster match between the two of these guys at Extreme Rules. Beyond question to me, the worst, least productive segment of the night had to be this U.S. title contract signing. This was so god-awfully stupid and so god-awfully brutal on so many different fucking levels. Let's start off with this first. When you have the crowd chanting for the heel manager because she's a blonde with legs and some tits, you got a problem with your segment. That's number one. And the fact that at this time of year, heading into your biggest show of the year, one of your biggest heat getters, one of your biggest attention getters, you've decided to back off of and take off of TV because you just have to film a fucking movie with Edge. Whoa! Are you a movie studio or are you a sports entertainment company? What's the priority? A crappy movie that people aren't going to go to the theaters and see because it probably won't even be released in the goddamn theaters? Or WrestleMania, your biggest show of the fucking year? Priorities, Vincent! Priorities! Oh, but wait, there's more. Instead of giving us Lana, 
they give us one of these ham and egg actors, one of the worst actors that we've seen. And even Claire Lynch thinks that this jabroni fucking sucked. And I know the announcers were told by Vince halfway through to start pooning this guy and burying this guy. Well, who fucking signed off on this shit? Who put this guy in this goddamn position to begin with? Didn't you test whether or not he could actually talk with a Russian accent? Why even bother? And even what's more astounding about this is you've got John Cena doing what he so often does. Instead of being a hero with hero qualities, he's a villain with bully qualities. The fuck is this guy doing? And even then, as you sit there and are given no reasons to get behind John Cena whatsoever, and you're given no reasons to have any sympathy for him or any ability to really relate to what his cause and what he's talking about, now you've got Rusev. He still doesn't have to do the match. Why does he have a lawyer if he's still going to do the fucking match? If he's the one that had to make the decision and only he could make the decision and even Lana couldn't make the decision, then he still had the option to turn away and run. Why do they do this to their talents? Why do they make their talents look so fucking stupid? Because that's exactly what Rusev looked like, was fucking stupid. And now you've had this guy get submitted to the point where he passed out, get revived with a bottle of water, just so that way he could tap out, to now this week, he's going on this long diatribe of bullshit just to sign the fucking contract anyway, and then throw in a bitch shot on Cena and cut tail and run. Everything about this is an epic fucking disaster. Seriously, this is horrible. It shouldn't be that hard. It can't possibly be that hard. Yet WWE finds a way to make it hard. See, even that bullshit was better than that asshole Russian accent. When they do these sit-down, raw-style interviews, if you will, man, Lesnar really shines. I mean, he really, really shines. My one question to the WWE you would think you would want to maximize whatever usage you have of Brock Lesnar. And if you only have him for a limited number of days, why in the fuck would you not have done more of these interviews? Why would you not record several of them at a time? Maybe even make it a month's worth of a series of like mini vignettes, if you will, talking about this, and then it builds to that, and then the next week it's that, and the next week it's that. You get this one glimpse here, and Lesnar in this type of role, the way he comes across very close to who he is as a real person, is fucking awesome. I just wish you'd get more of it. Why is Eric Rowan Big Show's bitch? Can anybody answer that? He literally is now Big Show's personalized jobber bitch. How is that ever designed to get Eric Rowan over? How is that ever designed to give this guy a chance? You're making him the jobber bitch to a guy that nobody gives a fuck about anymore. Of course, we couldn't be bothered to actually have Brock Lesnar on Raw physically show up, you know, two weeks before WrestleMania. Why would we want to do that? Whatever. And, you know, I get the whole notion that fans are still angry about Roman Reigns winning the Rumble and then beating Daniel Bryan at Fastlane. They don't think the guy is ready. They don't think he's earned this spot. They don't think he's the best choice, the right choice, or any real choice at all at this point in time. Whatever. So I get why people are interrupting Roman Reigns when he's trying to talk. They're chanting Daniel Bryan. I think it's kind of stupid, kind of petty and childish, but at the end of the day, it's what the fuck ever. But I do want to point out again that if people think the only thing that is wrong with that title match, that main event at WrestleMania 31, is Roman Reigns, then they need to reevaluate their current course of thinking. If they think that Roman Reigns being in that spot is the major problem, the biggest problem, or anywhere close to a problem compared to some of the other problems with this, then again, they are mistaken. This whole shit of Paul Heyman, it's basically get Mike, talk a little, cut off Mike, talk a little more, same old shit, repeat. Every week. We're going to knock this person or that person for saying the same type of shit in their promos. They're always regurgitating the same type of basic talking points. I don't understand why Paul Heyman gets such a free pass. Yes, I understand. He is great at what he does. He is incredible. He is a fantastic mouthpiece. The guy can talk asses into seats. He can talk you into being interested. But... So many of you aren't interested in Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 31. 
And you cannot sit there and tell me it is just strictly due to Roman Reigns or even the fact that it's not Daniel Bryan. Because the dynamics of Daniel Bryan versus Brock Lesnar would be equally as idiotic. Because Lesnar still wouldn't be there every fucking week. Paul Heyman would still be saying the same type of shit for the most part every fucking week. And then Daniel Bryan would be featured in a somewhat inconsequential way, just like he currently is being now, heading into that IC title match at WrestleMania. There are major problems with this WWE World Heavyweight Championship match at WrestleMania. And as I referenced a few months ago, the biggest problem for the WWE with WrestleMania 31 was their main event problem because they didn't fucking have one. And they didn't. And they don't. And you can clearly, clearly see that. But again, I must emphasize, as even here, Reigns was okay. It was short, sweet, to the point, fine, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, exit stage left, get the fuck out of Dodge. You're still not going to be on board with it. But it doesn't matter who was going to be in that spot. This was going to be a fart of a match at WrestleMania. It's a fart of a feud, period. And if you think that Roman Reigns is the biggest or most significant reason for that problem, then you, my friends, are mistaken. I was okay with them doing a little kind of dry run of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I'm fine with that. I'm sure some of you wanted Curtis Axel to have his shine and have his big moment. But at the end of the day, it was all about Mark Henry. Because that's what he do! That's what he do! And if you don't like Mark Henry, well... If you don't like Mark Henry, fuck you! Mm, mm. The Hall of Fame announcement for this week was the living legend, a real living legend, Larry Zabisco. Oh, baby. He's going to go there to the Hall of Fame weekend and talk about his golf game for 20 minutes. I wonder if Chris Jericho and him have a tea time set up for Santa Clara <laughs> that weekend. <laughs> Fucking Larry Zabisco. <laughs> I wonder if he's going to wear it. His karate robe, and he's gonna have his nunchucks with him or not? Ow, baby! <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> Wasn't he? Did he marry a freaking uh, Vern Gagne's daughter? Wasn't he like the daughter or son-in-law? <laughs> so he was doing Triple H shit before Triple H was doing Triple H shit. Praise God! You might want to talk about wrestling isn't wrestling, and you'll notice that great video, and it's a great video. It only works because of one reason and one reason alone, and that's because it centers around the story of God. It's a biblical video. It's, it really is. But again, I emphasize, Zabisco was doing Triple H shit before Triple H was even terrorizing, let alone doing Triple H shit. I hope him and Chris Jericho can hit the links this weekend. I hope to see Larry Zabisco and his nunchucks in the Hall of Fame ceremony. <laughs> so the six-man tag on Raw featuring six of the guys that are going to be in that IC title ladder match at WrestleMania is kind of what you would expect with a match involving this, this six guys. Had a lot of high spots, had a lot of good moments. It was good, fast-paced action, and it really grabbed the crowd and got their attention. However, with that said... Just because you do a bunch of spectacular spots and shit doesn't mean the shit is going to be good, especially when it comes to WrestleMania 31. Furthermore, with as much as those six guys were doing in the ring, the guy that still captivates and still entertains the most in this entire thing is the guy that more often than not isn't fucking wrestling, and that's our truth At this point in time, having anybody other than our truth win that IC title would be a bad decision, in my opinion. Anybody else winning it other than our truth makes it kind of ridiculous and pointless to do this whole freaking thing. He's been the star of this. He's the guy that I now want to win this, and I don't think I'm the only one. The really hard thing to be asked to do is to carry a story by yourself, to carry a feud and develop a feud and advance a feud, basically, all by yourself. And I have to give mad respect to Bray Wyatt because he has done the best he can as a performer to do just that, to advance a feud by himself, to advance a story by himself. And that's something that is usually reserved for the biggest and best of veterans and stars, and even they can't always get the job done. But with that said, though, you know, the fact that Bray Wyatt is being put in this position and asked to do this and being set up for this match, this lose-lose situation with Taker at WrestleMania, is still kind of ridiculous to me. It's a year too late. It's the wrong timing and, frankly, the wrong opponent for Bray Wyatt.
at least once in a while, the WWE still flashes their occasional ability to tell a story, at least if nothing else, to tell a story that will play out throughout the course of a three-hour raw. They at least create some form of mini-episodic television. And they did that this week with this whole thing between Seth Rollins and Randy Orton. And throughout the entire night, Seth Rollins coming out and really uh, taking it to the other members of the Authority, frankly, and getting in their faces and having the Authority members acting like they don't want any part of him, that he's got too big of his for his britches and everything else. And even though you sat there the whole time and you knew this was going to result in some type of predictable swerve at the end of the night where everybody's going to be kumbaya and coming out to try and get Orton, it was still relatively well done. I don't know if it needed to be done. I don't know if it really served much of a purpose, but it was done, and the WWE did a solid job with what they did. Like I said, even though you knew what was going to happen. And then once it actually did happen, you even knew the swerve that was going to happen, the surprise finish. But this is what WWE is today. You get a lot of crap that doesn't matter, a lot of crap that is stupid and just pisses you off, but you get that one thing, that one real glimmer of hope, that one real beacon of light that stands out that makes you say, man, that's why I'm still a fan. That's why I put up with all this other useless garbage. It's because of stuff like this. And man, I tell you, when everybody from the authority surrounds the ring and they're getting ready to come in and those lights come out with Randy Orton standing there in the middle of the ring with the chair, you know what's coming. And it just felt like a big deal because it was Sting. One of the few highlights of this entire WrestleMania season has been Sting. The fact that Sting is there makes it feel at least somewhat like WrestleMania season more than maybe anybody else truly does. And when the lights go out and on comes Sting. It's like you're going back to WCW in 1997 and it's all the NWO and there's DDP and there's Sting to come out and kind of save the fucking day. This shit was incredible. This shit was awesome. This is the type of stuff that professional wrestling used to give us. This is the type of stuff that professional wrestling from time to time still can give us. And this is the type of stuff that even the WWE could figure out a way to give us from time to time. And even after the show goes off the air and they're doing a little interview in the ring, Orton's talking about, man, you know, I don't need anybody's help. But I got to admit, that was pretty cool. You're damn right. It was really fucking cool. I like what they've done with Orton's character here at least a little bit. I didn't like the way they set up to this Orton Rollins match at WrestleMania because I thought the slow burn was the wrong way to go, but I love the way they incorporated Sting here at the end, and they're really building up Sting and Triple H into the best possible monster that they can. Look, I told you before, and I'll say it again, I wanted Sting versus Taker at this year's WrestleMania, not Sting versus Triple H. Sting and Taker is the dream match, not Sting Triple H, but that is a match we've thought about before. That is a match we've talked about before, and I'm going to put it to you this way. I know a lot of people are going to sit there and look at this match, like the IC title ladder match, and think that that's going to be the match of the night. They're going to look at Orton and Rollins and the storytelling that's going into it and the two performers in it and think that that match has a chance to rock and dominate the night and be the match of the night, be the match that steals the show. And there's a possibility that, that could be the case. But I just got that feeling. I've just got that sense. Even though a lot of it flies in the face of logic, that the match that is going to rock the house, the match that is going to tear the house down, the match that is going to steal the show at WrestleMania 31 is going to be Sting versus Triple H. I got that sense. I've got that feeling. It's hard to quantify, but I know I'm not the only one that feels it. And even though a lot of people will sit there and say, you know, Triple H is going to have to carry the entire thing and Sting is going to be wrestling in a t-shirt. It's about something bigger. It's not always about the flips and the kicks and the punches. It's about the ability to tell a story. And that is something that Sting has always been really good at and Triple H as well. And if you really think that heading into his first ever match in the WWE, his first ever WrestleMania, that Sting is going to go out there and stink up the joint and suck hind tit, I got news for you. Sting is going to tell you at WrestleMania why Sting is the icon and why it's such a big deal that he finally came to the WWE. I put money on it right now. The match of the night, the match that people are going to be talking about the most from a pure entertainment and enjoyment standpoint is going to be Sting versus Triple H. So if this is the angle that had to end the show to set up to that match that, in my money, might as well be the damn main event of WrestleMania 31, then more power to him. This was by far the best Raw of the past few weeks, which really isn't saying shit because this show still wasn't very good. 
This is still going to shape up to be a largely forgettable WrestleMania, and you saw elements of that throughout this entire show. But man, oh man, did they give you that one thing. It's always with the WWE. It's that one fucking thing that they try to get you to forget about all the other shit. And while I can't forget about all the other shit, that one thing they gave me was pretty damn cool this week.